you can keep it now. Thank you so much. Okay. So I'm delighted to see everybody. And it's, it's extraordinary that I've only been here for about a month and I recognize almost every face here. So it's a small community and a great community. And I'm delighted to be here. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to showing you examples uh, from three main bodies of work, along with some transitional pieces created from the mid 1980s to the present. Though you will note that my style and subject matter vary widely, I hope you will see the unifying thread as I trace the evolution of my work. Questions may arise uh, as I'm speaking, as this is going to be a very packed program. So please make a note for the Q&A at the end. Before I begin though, I'd like to say a brief word about the name of this presentation. I've entitled this talk, Art for Earth's Sake, because first of all, my work has always been devoted to celebrating the beauty and diversity of this world. Second is to contrast it with the philosophy of art for art's sake, which has dominated the art scene for over a century. I feel it's important to make this distinction now because of the times we live in, with degrading ecosystems, biodiversity loss, and an increasing dire climate emergency. Because the philosophy of art for art's sake that holds that the only true art must be divorced from any moral or social artist at a moment when she or he is urgently needed because art has the capacity to stir our emotions. Sadly, we know that, um, that statistics alone cannot move people to want to act on behalf of the earth. Because of our growing awareness of the interconnections of all life, we are collectively waking up from our sense of an isolated self to one in which, as deep ecologist John Seed proclaimed, myself now includes the rainforest. It includes clean air and water. As art critic and, and historian Susie Gadwick wrote, this transforms self engenders in the artist a sense of ethical responsibility towards the social and environmental communities. Uh, so to begin, we'll, we'll start with uh, a 13-minute video uh, of my mixed media series, Conscious Evolution, the world at one that uh, Ian uh, spoke about in the introduction. So um, I am going to be reading aloud the, the quotes in case there's uh, some difficulty reading them. And um, it's a very meditative um, program. So just sit back and relax. It's very, it's, uh, it's a contemplative work. So whenever you're ready. time in the history of humanity, we were, able to, we were able to see our planet for what it really is. Theodore Hesburgh, uh, former president of Notre Dame University. Thank you. 
stood in the blue darkness and looked in awe at the earth from the lunar surface, what I saw was almost too beautiful to grasp. Apollo astronaut Eugene Cernan. Each man comes back feeling that he is no longer only an American citizen, he is a planetary citizen. Again, that's astronaut Edgar Mitchell. point of beginning to know itself. Oops, just hit that thing that says cancel. You know what? We're going to have to go back to the beginning of that because there's no way to. You can just pull that. You definitely can pull that. I'm so sorry, everybody. Oh, well, that's not your fault. How did you do that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I can say whatever you did. All right. Incredible. Okay. So we're okay. We're close. reached a point of beginning to know itself. Man is the star's way of knowing about stars. Professor George Wald, Nobel Laureate, Harvard Biological Laboratory. society, a waste and transformation of nations, which depends directly upon change in citizens, transformation in each cell of the body planetary.
carried on the capacity and responsibility of any single nation. An era of unprecedented cooperation is essential. This was uh, published in the Global 2000 Report, which was commis commissioned by President Jimmy Carter, and it was written in 1972. This piece is called Global 2000. What we will need to need to avoid catastrophe is a critical mass of people and ultimately of nations who have adopted goodwill as their dominant expression in personal and international affairs. The people who are living on this planet <clears throat> need to break with the narrow concept of human liberation and begin to see liberation as something which needs to be extended to the whole of the natural world. What is needed is liberation of all the things that support life, the air, the water, the trees, all the things that support the sacred web of life. And uh, this is the Haudé Nationale, Six Nations, Iroquois Confederacy. Conscious evolution, a definition. Conscious evolution, noun, Latin, conscious to know of, evolutio, and unfolding. Hence, the shared knowledge of and participation in the unfolding of creation. The emerging potential of human beings to take responsibility individually and collectively for a positive future. Two, the process by which an individual human consciousness can transform itself from a state of fear and alienation to one of enlightened cooperation. Three, the capacity of a group to work together synergistically, that is to become a functional entity with capabilities beyond the sum of its individual parts. Four, the potential of humanity to develop a resonant relationship within the parts of itself, with the planet Earth, and with the cosmos to evolve consciously. Someday, after we've mastered the wind, the tides, and gravity, we will harness the energies of love. And then for the second time in history, man will have discovered fire. And that's uh, Pierre.
Liberté Art de Chardin. So we're going to go into uh, the next slide and a series that I created uh, following, it was a transitional piece, I would say. It's um, entitled All My Relations, and you can go to the next slide. It incorporates the symbolism from my beginning iconography on iconographic studies with contemporary cosmology. These pieces are in the shape of a medicine wheel, an American Indian healing tool and salutation. The upper left image represents the plants and the elements, and on the upper right, the animal kingdom. The central piece is entitled Children of Gaia Descended from Stars, and focuses on humanity and shows each of us as the result of 15 billion years of unbroken evolution. It is named after the Gaia hypothesis, which proposes that the Earth is a living, self-regulating system developed by evolutionary biologist Lynn Margulis and atmospheric chemist James Lovelock, who uh, incidentally recently passed away. Now we're going to get into some landscapes. Um, in the early 1990s, I moved from New York City to the high desert of Colorado. Without a studio, I took up plein air landscape painting, and my studio became the great outdoors. What was to become my primary painting subjects, Provence and the American Southwest, reflects the two fundamental aspects of my own nature the tradition and cultivation that is characteristic of the small family farms and village life of Provence, and the wild and free, intensely spiritual landscape of the American West. Uh, just a word about plein air painting. And I know there are a few, I think there are some plein air pain, painters here in the audience. Um, much like an outdoor sport, painting on plein air is physically demanding where the constraints of changing light and weather conditions are constant challenges. It also requires a blend of patience and alacrity, a unique kind of concentration, a state of mind that is both relaxed and alert, and the ability to be present, fully present in each moment. 
So following are some uh, paintings that I created in and of the American Southwest. These are all in pastel, unless otherwise noted. Okay. This piece is uh, entitled Morning, Morning Glory. I was uh, given permission to paint on the grounds of a Carmelite monastery in Crestone, Colorado, where I created a series of nine paintings done in all four seasons and different times of day. This is the same tree in winter. It's called White Silence. And it's, uh, from, uh, it's a view from one of the hermitage at the Carmelite Monastery. This piece is entitled Hoarfrost, which depicts uh, a mystical weather condition in the high desert where everything is encased in ice and the frozen water crystals in the air create tiny rainbows. This piece is uh, entitled White Sands Horizontal, and it's of White Sands National Monument in uh, southern New Mexico, where I spent several days photographing and painting. I find that White Sands and the desert in general uh, is a very mystical landscape. It's the same uh, same place, another landscape created by from photographs and sketches. This is a large piece, so uh, when I do large pieces, they're created in the studio studio because it's um, they're too large to be carted into the into the uh, outdoors in the field. So these next pieces are from Provence, where I returned over a period of 10 years to paint in all four seasons. This piece is uh, entitled uh, Hayfield, and it was created after uh, sketches and, and photographs I took of Provence. I returned to my studio to create this piece in oil and encaustic on panel. So I have a real, uh, love affair with lavender. Um, this is called Lavender Field Late After. Oops. Right, I put the head by accident. I'm so sorry. This is the next one. Okay, so this is, yeah, I thought they were out of order. So um, this is entitled Cherry Orchard, uh, after another after sketch and photograph. In the foreground, you can see uh, this, and by the way, these are all real colors. I don't jazz them up or anything. It is a, a spelt field. Uh, when it's just getting started and has this characteristic chartreuse green color, which is just phenomenal to see. Uh, and next is the lavender. So I've done lavender in uh, all, all times of day. Uh, this piece uh, was done in, in the late afternoon, was painted in plain air, and uh, it was extremely hot. And when the late afternoon sun hits the lavender, uh, which kind of appear blue in the shade, which you can kind of see in the upper left-hand corner, it turns a kind of mauve color. This is the difference between what's known as local color, uh, which is the obvious idealized color of an object. Uh, for instance, a, a lemon would be considered yellow versus color vibration. And that is the way light affects uh, uh, the color of an object. Uh, again, taking the example of a lemon, if you put it next to, uh, say, like a bowl that's uh, blue, it's going to appear green. A green it's going to have a greenish cast. So um, that's one of the things that you learn um, as a landscape painter. This is. The cut lavender. This is how it looks in the in the um, in the fall. And um, anyway, I love to I love to capture it in all its manifestations. Next is another transitional piece. It's entitled Epiphany, um, and it is it was the beginning of a series of earthscapes. It's executed in oil 
on canvas and measures 40 by 60 inches. When I had completed my years of landscape painting, I resumed working in the studio. I wanted to work in oils and return to painting the Spanish point of space. This is a view of our planet from near Earth orbit. And the Earth from any perspective is resplendent. So now <laughs> uh, we're getting into uh, Byzantine Russian icon. So as mentioned, um, in 1996, I had the rare opportunity to begin learning Byzantine Russian icon painting with a master iconographer from Russia. I wanted to learn the medium of egg tempera and gold leaf, which they're created in, and thought I would learn the technique and then be on my merry way and do my own thing. <laughs> but I was totally captivated by the materials and the symbolism <clears throat> and remained a student of traditional iconography for many years. This is an icon of a guardian angel. There's not enough time to describe all the stages and symbolism in creating an icon, but it's important to know that the stages of creating an icon recapitulate the act of our own creation. When done according to the canon, which is a special set of rules governing spiritual practice and icon painting techniques, each stage from gessoing the board to applying the final also oil sealant has a precise symbolic meaning. Briefly, the icon begins with a wooden board, which represents the tree of life. <clears throat> to this, 13 layers of white gesso are applied, which puts the iconographer into a state of contemplation. <clears throat> the pure white gessoed board represents pure consciousness. The next stage, carving the image into the icon board, represents an idea in the mind of God. The image is meant to impress itself upon the iconographer in a gradual process of transfiguration. This is the opposite of Western religious and secular art in that the icon symbolizes the teachings of the saints, ascetics, and leaders in, in, of the church throughout the centuries and not attributed to the genius of the individual artist. This is the icon of Archangel Michael of the Apocalypse, uh, who is known as the protector of the earth. Here he is shown in his capacity as the, I don't know how to archi strategist, archi strategist, archi strategist, or chief commander of all the heavenly powers. Uh, you can see that name in the upper right hand corner. I chose this icon because I felt we were kind of moving into that kind of apocalyptic, uh, you know, phase. Uh, so we can go to the next. This is a, a detail of the previous slide. If you look closely, Archangel Michael's spear is piercing the tongue of the dragon. I was fascinated with this, and I, when I was making the icon, I asked my teacher what the tongue of the dragon. Represented, He said to me, it represents, quote, the lies of civilization at the end of the world. This was a man with real gravitas, you know, with a deep Russian accent. And um, that was in 2011, and the political lies, though disturbing, were nothing compared to what they are now in the U.S. If you believe in the maxim, as above, so below, it's good to think about this battle for the truth being won in heaven. So now we're um, segueing into uh, my contemporary icons. Not long into the practice of traditional icon painting, I knew something was missing in the canon of images. Nature was relegated to the backdrop of the human divine drama. Being a student of ecology, cosmology, and evolution, I was acutely aware that humans are derivative of the earth and I wanted to expand the canon of images to include the earth itself. So I started conceptualizing a new icon. This icon is entitled the earthly paradise, icon of the third millennium. It was created in the same method and materials as traditional icons. 
you can see I added another dimension to the physical planet by encircling the fragile envelope of the atmosphere with a gold halo to portray the earth as having reached its fulfillment as a bio-spiritual entity. So here we move into my current series, Sacred Icons of Threatened and Endangered Species. In 2016, having become more aware of the biodiversity crisis, I conceived of this new series. As of now, there are 20 in the series. I will be showing you a, a sampling of them. Uh, they will be exhibited in an exhibition in December in New York City, where climatologists James Hansen and climate activist Bill McKibben will be speaking. I've added another dimension to this project by donating half the proceeds from the sales of these icons to the Center for Biological Diversity and other conservation organizations. Okay. So this image of the honeybee was the first in the series. And as I said, I've used exactly the same process in making these as I do in traditional icons. This industrious, iconic insect gives humans so much in the way of their honey, pollen, and irreplaceable work as pollinators. They are severely threatened due to the use of toxic pesticides, destruction of habitat, and lack of forage due to monocultures. The most worrisome threat is agricultural use of toxic chemicals, which have been found to short circuit beast memory and navigation. I've also just read that cell phone radiation has been found uh, to paralyze their central, their cellular respira respiration. And after just 10 minutes of exposure to a cell phone, the bees could hardly metabolize sugars, fats, or proteins. Without bees and other pollinators, coffee, apples, almonds, tomatoes, and cocoa, to name just a few of the crops, would be wiped out. However, all species, all species have intrinsic value, not just their use to human beings. This is an icon of the Florida panther. This it's a reserve, steady, stealthy predator of enormous physical grace and power. The Florida panther is one of the most majestic large felines in the wild. Once found throughout the Southeast United States, the Florida panther now is critically endangered, occupying only a small area of South Florida, about 5% of its former range. It now numbers just 100 to 120 individuals. Human encroachment and vehicle collisions are the main threats to this majestic animal. Okay. Oops, have them out of order. Um, this is the chambered nautilus. Uh, it's been around for about 500 million years, even before the dinosaurs, and now it is endangered. The main threats are over-harvesting, habitat loss, and climate change. Populations in some areas, such as the Phil in the Philippines, are declining due to overfishing. One serious climate change-related issue is ocean acidification, which affects the Nautilus's ability to build its calcium carbonate-based shell. <clears throat> This is the Mexican blue cap hummingbird. This gorgeous diminutive bird lives in a small area within the Mexican province of Oaxaca. Tragically, as, as is the case with so many species today, its numbers are dwindling due to habitat loss. Consequently, it is listed as endangered. This is one of my more recent pieces. It's the uh, West Indian manatee. Over half of the, the more than a thousand manatees deaths in Florida in 2021 are attributed to starvation. This mass die off is being caused by pollution fueled algal blooms that have decimated 
thousands of acres of seagrass, which is their main food source. The US Environmental Protection Agency was recently sued for failing to protect manatees and sea turtles from water pollution in Florida. This is the horseshoe crab. They're an ancient animal, more than half a billion years old. And yet their numbers today are in steep decline due to human activity. You may not know this, but the biomedical industry bleeds horseshoe crabs to man manufacture a detector for ba bacterial contamination. Although synthetic, synthetic alternatives now exist, this practice continues. A large percentage of them die after bleeding or cease to be able to reproduce. Other threats are over harvesting for bait, fishing bycatch, and uh, habitat loss and pollution. Five million of them are harvested per year. This uh, is hard to see, I know, but this is how they're being treated and, and used by the biomedical industry. This is the Sumatran orangutan, people of the forest. The meaning of orangutan in the Malay language in Sumatra are listed as critically endangered. Ex extinction is likely in the wild within the next 10 years. The recent history is heartbreaking. It is a story of losing their only home to bulldozing and burning to make ready for palm plantations and other monocultures. Poaching, hunting, illegal logging uh, inside protected areas and unsustainable logging in concessions where orangutans live remains a major threat to their survival. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you uh, when to uh, uh, well, let's watch the, this short video and we won't go through the whole thing. It's a little too long, but um, this is what it's... So this is happening right now in Indonesia. And they'll just round him up and bring him somewhere to a zoo. Um, these gentle creatures will be extinct without serious intervention, but we'll have Nutella. Okay, you can go to the next one. This is a pangolin. It's the most trafficked animal on the face of the earth, poached and slaughtered for their scales. For the same reason, rhinos are being hunted to extinction. Magical powers is assigned to another body part. Their scales, ironically, are used for protection in the wild, but, will, but attract lethal human predators from whom they have no protection. Okay. This is the loggerhead sea turtle. 
Sea turtles are an ancient species, having been around since the time of the dinosaurs, about 110 million years. The loggerhead sea turtle is listed as critically endangered. The major threats to their existence are plastics, which they ingest, mistaking them for food, oil spills, they often mistake the pools of renegade oil from, for the sargassum seaweed that they need for their survival. Many areas where drilling occurs are critical sea turtle habitats. Other serious threats are the accidental catching of turtles in commercial fishing gear and oil on beaches that pollute hatchling and nesting areas. This is a quote from Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologica, which I find deeply inspiring and expresses for me the spirituality of biodiversity. Because the divine could not image itself forth in any one being, it created the great diversity of things, so that what was lacking in one would be supplied by the others, and the whole universe together would participate in and manifest the divine more than any single being whatsoever. There's a phrase called that, uh, there's only one everything. And it's another way of saying what you just said. Uh, and this last side, the slide is uh, a quote from cultural historian, Thomas Berry, who was my mentor for many years. When all is said and done, this is what we have to remember. While the human cannot make a blade, thank you. I do want to say that you know the, the trend is it's it's starting to happen where artists are being more engaged that art that uh, um, the exhibition that I mentioned that's going to be in New York City in December it's called Mayday Earth and um, 
it's a group exhibition and it's about climate change, biodiversity, and uh, it's been ongoing. It's been held three years in a row. It was curated by Marsha Annenberg, who I think is on, on Zoom. And uh, so the, the, it is happening, but slowly, you know? I mean, for me, one of the greatest motivational films was An Inconvenient Truth, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that just shows you what, you know, what power art really does have. Mary? I wondered if you could say something about the presence of the beings in the, in the contemporary icons you made and the presence in the traditional icons. Because it, it seemed to me that uh, part of the power of the endangered species icons is that they, they are very much meeting us as equal beings. Of beings of equal importance and coming into our lives in a very direct and sensual way. And I know part of what one does with a traditional icon is to venerate it. And, and yet it too partakes of the divine. So I was just curious about your ruminations on all that. Well, each one of them, thanks Mary for the question. Um, each one of them has a different energy. So I can say that, uh, you know, the bee was in a work of precision and um, an intricacy. One that I didn't show you was a blue iguana. And that really tore me up because, uh, you know, I don't know if it's, this thing about the reptilian brain or whatever, but I was extremely agitated while I was doing it. And uh, another difference with traditional icons is there's a set method for doing it, right? You know, I was talking about the different stages um, and the, it's like, no worry. You know, you just know where you're going with it, where these are uh, terra incognita. Um, on the other hand, the manatee just, it just, you know, it was the easiest birth you can imagine. Someone said, our, our friend Gail, who lives in co-housing, said, this is like painting a big balloon. <laughs> and, you know, and they are like the most gentle creatures. If you go, there's a, the uh, Save the Manatee Club has this manatee cam where you can go on and they have this really gentle music and you just watch them floating, you know. And it's like, it's a great meditation. So yes, I, they do have a presence for sure. And it's very different from doing the icons, uh, the traditional icons. Thank you. Yeah. Carol. In, uh, your exhibition in New York is associated with all the conference of the parties, Conca Fox 16, which is going to be, I think, December 16th to 19th in Montreal, and it's on bio, specifically the conflicts of the parties on biodiversity. So I didn't know it was going to be in Montreal. Should I repeat that for the Zoom people? Sure, yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. Yeah. It's COP. COP26, we know about it. Yes, yeah, so the COP26 is a UN. Right. Be in, uh, Egypt. Okay. COP 16, was, which is on biodiversity, was supposed to have been in China. Right. And Instead, Kuning. it's going to be in Montreal. Okay. So, and what, what are the dates? I, it's December, I think, 16th to 19th. Oh, this is great. So, Marcia, you need to listen to this. She's on Zoom. Um, the uh, conference on biodiversity is going to be. Uh, December, and it's during the dates of our uh, show. So maybe there's a way to tie in something. Uh, yeah. And it's going to be in Montreal, as a matter of fact. Thank so you so much for bringing that's that great. It's good to know. I, I somehow thought it was going to be in China in October, but now we know. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, I just wanted to say uh, uh, powerful the image of art and it's made, and it, it kind of I 
can think about um, uh, my conscience as being uh, uh, God given my dad and how that kind of is an icon, a type, um, and there's so much energy that goes into the work uh, and into your work. And I think there's something to be found about um, what it means to be human or a human, human beings looking at themselves from the outside. Like in that, in that being you know, God giving life to Adam, you're sort of looking at humans in a new way. And I feel like your work actually makes us look at the human being in a new way. Uh, in a new way, and I'd like to know uh, a recognition of the privilege of what it means to be human, but also uh, the amount of care that's required on the planet, and that's partly represented by the amount of energy you put into the actual creation. So, you see this in beautiful work. And I was wondering if you were influenced by those types of paintings, which is kind of a sense of almost marvelization. But then the fatigue is so long. Um, well, I was always interested as a child in, in uh, 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 illuminated manuscripts and things like that. So I'm sure that, you know, fed into it. But I do want to, you know, acknowledge what you said about a, a kind of a, a changing uh, self-concept of being human. And uh, some of the philosophy behind what I do is... Um, in the work of Teilhard de Chardin and also Thomas Berry, uh, who very succinctly said, the human is that being in which the earth achieves self uh, conscious awareness and celebrates itself. And it can be said for the whole universe. That's why that one piece that I did called uh, A Star's Way, where you see the people contemplating the stars, that was, um, uh, to express that thought. Yeah. Uh, I kind of, I like how it started, forgive me if I got this exactly, um, it, like, you started with some Russian technology and you're so broad into basically now and then, essentially. What, how did you get interested in space? Like, what was your, what was the, <laughs> Uh, you know what I'm getting at? <laughs> yeah, you're going to laugh because it was Star Trek to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah, and, and I fell into it. It was like, um, you know, I was reading a lot, um, uh, actually three books, which really impressed me. And I was reading these accounts of the astronauts, you know, that really moved me. And um, so then when I started to uh, create that series, the Conscious Evolution series, that opened up a whole world to me, NASA. And then that series uh, was also shown in Mexico City uh, at the Third Planetary Congress of the Association of Space Explorers, which is a group, in order to get into this group, you have to have orbited the Earth at least once. So, uh, you know, it just kind of, it was like the domino effect. And, uh, and I do believe that, the, you know, the, like Theodore Hesburgh said, the greatest fallout of the space program was not the close-up view of the moon, but the uh, look at a spaceship Earth from afar. And I still, I, you know, I don't really think that wasting our money going up to, you know, going back to the moon, for instance, I just read about this, or Mars, I don't think it's, um, I think we know, I think we've, we've had that uh, kind of epiphany, you know, what, who we are and it, the, the limits to growth and we're living in a finite planet. So part of what I try to do is impart you know, this, these uh, feelings and ideas to people. Hopefully, you know, we can learn how to live sustainably on this planet. But space is a very good vantage point for these ideas. There's, a, there's an interesting movie, sort of a documentary done in an exciting style. It's called uh, Lunacy. And they follow five different characters, people, um, who've built their lives around the moon. And so, we, you know, one of them is, you know, one of them is a young man who is really committed to that dream of going to the moon and feels that 
the government has let us down. We should be vacationing on there by now. And they go to high schools <laughs> all across the southern states to appeal to their <laughs> colleagues and, and, you know, essentially to round up the troops and say, okay, let's get this going, everybody. And it's sort of bittersweet and sad in a way, too. There's a Las Vegas, Nevada, um, you know, selling property on the moon and purchase. <laughs> People who build their lives about the moon. And um, there's just something I think as well about art and imagery and visioning, visioning together with other humans about um, this is one of the uh, prime icons in our field of vision every day, the moon. And, you know, the, this view of the earth and this, you know, sort of symbiotic relationship with the tides and everything, going to the moon, looking back on ourselves, that vantage point, just sort of staying anyways. I thought I'd mention lunacy. <laughs> it's right in the space. My my recommendation for the you know the absurdity of going back to the moon is a is a series called Space Force. <laughs> Anybody see this? <laughs> it's hilarious. Anyway, <laughs> I, I just have one comment from the Zoom uh, group here. Walter Long mentioned it was really pleasing to recognize patterns from the beautiful lavender painting in the reef background of the horseshoe crab icon. So oh, yeah. it really, you know, inspires those patterns going across um, those realms of your work. Right, the undulating waves yeah. of the fields. Thank you for that, Walter. Thanks, Walter. And uh, a pen just joined. I wonder if they thought we were just starting now. Mm -hmm. um, but Penny, just to let you know, we're in the Q&A section of the uh, talk and we'll send along a, a recording of the talk so you can view it. I'll message you right now about that. Patricia. Yes, thank you. I absolutely love the presentation. Thank you. Your work is beautiful and very, very touching. Um, uh, my question is. How what's the longest it take me to do one of the icons? Like how long does it seem to be working at it? Um I would say about a month. My other question was how do you decide which one? So do you have like a kind of like an endangered species website you go to and you look at them and then it comes to you, or does it actually come to you like you're just like you, how do you learn about which species exists and which one? Right. So the question was, how do I uh, choose uh, which, which species to depict? Um, it varies. So you know, to be very systematic, I wanted to have an equal amount of reptiles, birds, you know, mammals, you know, to kind of keep a balance. Um, and so I go looking for them. And unfortunately, there's a lot. Um, then sometimes I get really self-indulgent and it's like, I just wanna work with the color blue. So that's, I found the blue iguana. Um, and then sometimes, you know, like the pangolin was in the news really, you know, a lot. And I just thought, I can't not do this. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other. Oh, and the, the other thing is, is I try and envision them all together as a grouping, you know, because that, uh, so I, I, I think about how they'll work together in what I choose. Um, yeah, I think that's it. And then I guess that was my third question, which is like, do you sell them? Like, do people buy them? Yeah, yeah, I sell them. And your previous work too, you sell it, or is it? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, you know, that first series is in the museum. Uh, yeah, but, I asked the museum. Huh? Yeah, I asked the museum. Yeah, it's in the <laughs> National Air and Space Museum in the, of the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Um, I do sell prints of them, though. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you write your name on that list and say what you're interested in, I can send you a link to where you can, you know, buy uh, 
note cards, prints, stuff like that. Um, and then, uh, I, you know, I don't feature my landscapes, but I do still have a few hanging around. Uh, and, um, and the icons, uh, they like, they really fly off the shelf, you know? <laughs> So um, I, I, when I have a show, I borrow them back um, so I can have them all together. And so far, people have been really nice about lending them. Um, but I, I certainly do have some that are still for sale. And, um, and like I said, 50% goes to the Center for Biological Diversity. Or Save the Manatee Fund just got uh, uh, a chunk. Um, I actually produced a, fundra a fundraising limited edition print for them. And, uh... Yeah, I really enjoyed looking at the icons and hearing you share about the animals at the same time. And I hope you take this in a really positive way. It reminded me of children's work, you know, and that reading. And also that icon goes to the realm of reading in a way that we, they enter our psyche in a way different, you know, in terms of memory and observation than perhaps some other kinds of visual art might. And uh, yeah, the reading and the imagery go together in terms of was, uh, I love that part. Well, you know, so not, not, I want to just uh, speak to what you just said. The, the, term, ter, the term iconography means icon writing. Mm -hmm. And you actually write an icon. Yeah. Um, so it, it really relates to. I think there's something, those histories too, around uh, uh, literacy and different forms of literacy uh, and sharing ideas. And how do you read an image and remember it like a word? Well, funny you should mention that because I'm another, thing, another project that I'm working working on is uh, to produce a hard deck um, of 35 of my images. Uh, that means that I have 15 more to go uh, for November 2023. But um, the point is, is to bring this awareness to a new audience. Uh, um, and everything is written in the first person. So it's, I am the Florida Panther. You know, and so it it just helps you to identify more. And there's you know certain uh, things that you're going to be able to do with with these uh, images uh, to deepen your empathy and uh, to also take action. Yeah. So. And something I I think it, whether it's the space or the icon to me like learning a let's say you know. Learning an old school practice like right now, mm -hmm. say, is a form of time traveling. And space mm -hmm. is also all about time travel in a certain way. So it's when you really think about our ecological situation in our country. <laughs> and that's just something that, to my mind, if I was going to have fun with looking at your practice, I might say there's an element of time traveling. Well, I do, uh, you know, I, I do choose these mediums that are actually ancient. So yeah. I do, they have to speak to me on that level, actually. And as I was saying to you before, uh, I only got into oil painting after seeing that movie, Girl with a Pearl Earring. I don't, I'm not sure about Vermeer. And when his assistant brings back that lapis, and then he mixes it with the oil, the linseed oil. It was like, ah, I, I relate to it now, you know? So, yeah, Barbara. I have a question. So much as her as an expression of, of gratitude. And um, it has to do with, I mean, it's wonderful that this is a way of educating and um, enlightening people. And, one of my pet peeves is uh, uh, the, a lot of religious texts talk about, you know, stewardship and that, you know, humans have a responsibility to go to, we, like authority, we, you know, over the earth. And so, and it's ingrained, I think, in a lot of our culture still. I know that we've got the whole corporate greed happening as well, but 
moving, I love the way you moved into that we're in relationship and that we are all integrated and it also, and the whole space thing takes you beyond uh, what we see and what we know to the unknown and that we have to be humbled by all of that. And so I'm very grateful for that message. Thank you. I think, you know, if we just learn to cooperate with nature rather than dominate it, you know, instead of having a, a, a use relationship is what we have with the natural world now. We actually um, cooperate. I think, I think that's the answer. So it's not about stewardship as much as it is um, relational. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Sharon. You go first. I feel changed by what I've seen and heard. And I believe I know that certain images will bring me my my um, my prayer life, that that magnitude will be with me for a very long time. The compassion of the devote. Um, the pain and the beauty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Kimberly Smith. I just live in the river of Canada. And Oh, boy, thank you so much. Oh, okay. So we're, we're at the end of our program. Thank you so much for coming, all those that I know and don't know. 